What surpasses the horizons of sorcerers, cursed spirits, and strong fighters is overwhelming aggression that disregards all else like a calamity. What you are seeing right now, the performance from Yuji Itadori, is exactly that. It has been built up for a very long time, and funny enough, you have seen iterations of it before. What's different about this time is that it is an amalgamation of all of those previous times where Yuji would start to lose control, where his anger would take over his body and you would see it. The emotions that would come crashing down would boil into the pot that is anger and the result is overwhelming aggression that quite literally disregards all else, yourself included and others. This by no means is anything new for Yuji but this time is very much different. Consequences are higher. The anger is a lot more prevalent. So much so that when you read this chapter you can feel it. You can understand that rage, that hatred, that anger that you Yuji has and it kind of flows onto yourself in a really enjoyable way. Hands down for a lot of people I think this chapter may be one of your favourites. Don't get me wrong, Kaizen has always been extremely enjoyable and there's a ton of beautiful chapters within there but something feels different within here. And I think it's for the first time you're seeing Yuji not hold himself back but in such a way that is so dire and desperate that feels almost unsurpassable. Like he's going up against a wall that can't be broken down. Every other iteration that Yuji has had there is a glimmer of hope, a glimmer of victory, but this one feels so defeated and destroyed and difficult that you really don't know where it's going to go. How does Yuji evolve from here? How does Akatami twist and contort our own perspective on him as a character, as well as everyone else that's trying to go toe to toe with Sukuna? It is absolutely brilliant. This chapter brings up a lot of questions when it comes to Yuji's abilities. What is he going to be capable of? Is there some sort of awakening? Is he going to to get a cursed technique, a domain expansion, etc, etc. While we don't know the answers for this, it's fun to theorycraft it. It's fun to think about the possibilities and or opportunities that could come Yuji's way even so late within the story. But I think one of the most respectable things about it is that even without anything that makes Yuji technically special in terms of abilities or techniques, he's still going hand to hand with one of, if not the most powerful characters within the story. And Sukuna's not playing it easy, he's not holding holding back, not to mention the added emotional stress on top of Yuji facing his best friend, Megami. I think this chapter was timed perfectly. A lot of us were unsure where Yuji would go from here. He was the one lacking behind the most, so how do you bring him forward? How do you give him that spotlight once again? And now that Sukuna is outside of his body, can he even survive? Turns out, he definitely can. And it's because of that overwhelming aggression, it is because of that path to becoming a calamity, but surely there must be more things here. And I think there definitely is. There's some very specific or oddly choiced words that I think Sukuna does mention towards Yuji within this chapter. Basically being surprised by Yuji's strength and his durability, but also pointing out that he's a little bit different because he's from quote unquote back then, and that Kenjaku is rather twisted. This implication in itself opens up Yuji's, I guess, history, his bloodline, what he was created for, and the ulterior motives I think that Yuji plays as a vessel or a cage. An idea that has been lingering in my head for quite some time and I think would line up with a lot of people's thoughts is that maybe he is kind of just a reflection of Sukuna. That Kenjaku has tried to create another Sukuna in some way but using a different method with the cursed wombs. You can see the production process of those cursed wombs and Yuji is the final last one, being a human that is naturally born but is technically a cursed spirit. Funny enough this design philosophy or its architecture is exactly what Sukuna is, someone that was human that eventually evolved in some manner to become a cursed spirit, and evolving further to become what he is today. This type of evolution seems very difficult to mimic, and I would say that Yuji didn't technically evolve in that sense, but was more so created to already be evolved. That may be why he is utilized as a vessel, but it also brings up the question, is there more to him when it comes to his properties? Cannibalization is a massive thing when it comes to Sukuna. A lot of people think, including myself, that Sukuna has the ability to eat or devour cursed energy and use it for himself. It's not as simple or identical to a copy or mimic ability, but think about it as a true understanding of cursed energy. That someone can devour it, ingest it, understand it, and then wield it whatever way they see fit. And I feel like we've definitely seen versions of it from Sukuna, but it's hard to pinpoint there because we know so little about him. You can make a 
similar comparison to how Yuta functions within the story and his copy ability, seemingly Rika ingesting the cursed energy and then Yuta weaponizing it. It's funny when you put it into that perspective because it has to streamline through a cursed spirit back into a human sorcerer. You don't need that streamline if it's Sukuna. And if that is even just partially accurate or correct when it comes to Sukuna cannibalizing on cursed energy, Yuji may also be the exact same way. So instead of giving him abilities, instead of giving him these evolved techniques or a domain expansion, wouldn't it be funny to find out that the whole time throughout the story that Sukuna was with inside of him, that he was cannibalizing on all the cursed energy that Sukuna is. And it was weaving itself into Yuji's body, becoming one with him. So over time, he just naturally becomes powerful, but you don't see it as a point of progression. You don't see him learning a brand new technique. You don't see him trying to do all of these crazy things that are similar to Sukuna in terms of trying to steal his ability. Instead, Yuji just fights the way that he's always known. And yet he has continuously gotten more and more powerful. Now more than ever that Sukuna is disconnected from Yuji, we were all confused. We thought this is it. This is the end. There's no way he would survive this. Yuji's not powerful enough. But there is definitely something underneath here that we completely missed. That because of Sukuna being inside of Yuji's body, it has retroactively increased his abilities over time. Partially, we knew this, but we never knew to what extent. We never knew if he could steal Sukuna's abilities or if that's even possible. But why would he if he's just been cannibalizing on his cursed energy this entire time? Time. I think this chapter is proof in itself that Yuji has been evolving right in front of our eyes, but just not within that direct linear path. And his anger or his hatred, that overwhelming aggression, is what sets him apart. See, a lot of characters I feel can go into that overwhelming aggression, but they're actually taught not to. It's kind of penned as a cardinal sin within the sorcery world, that if you let your anger take over you, you'll most likely die. However, when you add a different perspective, you get what we have now, a character that that is filled with so much rage that is going toe to toe with one of the most powerful characters within the story and pulling off feats that he hasn't done before. I say that loosely because you could argue he's done this before, but I would say that the overall level of Yuji's approach is much different. This is different to Shibuya. This is different to Junpei. This is new and scary and kind of bleeds into the finale of the story with how Yuji doesn't need some crazy power up coming out of nowhere, that he doesn't need to learn a technique or a domain expansion just to keep up. If something has been ticking over in the background this entire time, he can hold his own right now. He can be a powerhouse that is so unpredictable because he is the only person that can be a calamity, that can partially use his anger to fight the hardest that you have ever seen. And it's working for him. It's keeping him alive. It's allowing him to grow. And while he doesn't have abilities to technically heal himself, his durability is through the roof. I can definitely see the evolution of his techniques, a different black flash, or maybe something spawning off of it. But having new ones entirely, as much as that would be very interesting and enjoyable, I feel maybe a little bit redundant to the character that he's become now. We've known him to be a brawler, someone that dishes out a lot of damage and takes a lot of damage, and backs it up with an insane amount of black flashes. When you add the anger on top of that, you take him much higher than he originally was. And with where we are within the story, I think it lines up rather nicely. See, even if you take into everything that I've just talked about, his character, his emotion, his physicality, it's still very much unpredictable. Akatami is still throwing out curveballs, and this chapter is just an amalgamation of everything that Yuji is and also isn't. He's struggling, he's quite literally suffering, but he's weaponizing it so efficiently, and he has a lot of suffering to weaponize. I don't think anything hurts more than seeing Yuji so vulnerable and so open to being vulnerable. You can read him like an open book. His face tells you everything that you need to know. You feel his anger, you feel his rage, and it just comes across effortlessly throughout this chapter. And it's all backed with this beautiful confrontation with Sukuna. It's also really great to know that Megami is still within there. And while it's not much, he's able to weaken Sukuna just a little bit. We've seen this before with Geto body. This opens up a plethora of opportunities
these ways that Sukuna can be weakened or finessed depending on the right people utilizing it. Currently Yuji is on his own, but it won't take long for others to catch up and come to his aid. This doesn't mean that we should think that Sukuna is defeatable. It gives us a slither of hope, just a little bit, but it's still not enough to be confident. Sukuna has been around for a long time. He knows how this game works. I would say it's only a matter of time before everything comes crumbling down, before he starts using bigger and more dangerous abilities either from Megami or his own arsenal. Let's not forget that there's two people there that really want to fight Sukuna, Megami's sister as well as Kashimo with his curated technique just for him. And while all of this is going on, the merge is about to take place, so even if they get close to defeating Sukuna, that will most likely interrupt them, and something will be born. Something will be spawned into this world. All of this really puts into perspective the ending of Kaizen, and this chapter is just the beginning of it. But I would love to hear all of your thoughts. Let me know how you felt right now. Thank you.